you know, one of the unique challenges of building on a remote site like this on an island is that everything we need for construction actually has to fit on a boat to get out there. And there's size and weight restrictions with that. And there's also weather restrictions. You know, here we are heading into winter, so storms are becoming more frequent. There's definitely more planning and logistics to think about. There's no hardware store around the corner uh, to run to if you break a bit. It just doesn't work that way on an island. Yeah, this is, uh, this is construction on the coast of Maine. All right, so let's take a moment and talk about the foundation design here. I'm gonna walk you through the process. So on typical site here in Maine, we have ledge. So we call bedrock ledge here in Maine. So that would be this. And on top of that ledge, there'll be varying amounts of soil. We call that overburden. Some spots the ledge will be poking up and we can see it and others it'll be buried in. So what we do, the first step is to pin the corners of the building so we know what the floor plan is and we wanna be able to lay that out on site. And so we can locate each one of these corners and then what the contractor does is take a piece of rebar and they drive it down until it hits the ledge. And we take this elevation and then our ideal finished floor elevation and we have some idea of what the topography beneath the building is. Now the trouble with this is at the building corner, the ledge elevation may be here, but you know, a few feet away, it might be up here. And so it's not consistent. This isn't like a flat plane that we just excavate to undisturbed soil and then set our footings on top of that. The bedrock is actually all over the place. So as we're thinking about what kind of foundation system to do, that influences it obviously. So couple of different types that we could explore. One is a slab on grade, right? Very economical type of construction for foundations. It conforms to the underlying topography of the ledge. But here in New England, we have frost and the frost penetrates the ground here about four feet. So almost no matter where we're gonna build on this site, we're gonna have frost to contend with. So we really ideally want this foundation pinned to that bedrock subsurface below. You know, the purpose of a foundation is to support the vertical and lateral loads that are on the structure and transfer those down into the ground below, whatever that might look like. And here with this bedrock, you know, we're not worried about the bearing capacity of it. It far exceeds those loads that we're introducing into it. Uh, but really we're worried about protecting it from frost and heaving up. So in this particular case, how do we insulate this slab? You know, if this is a heated conditioned living space, we need to keep it heated and we also don't want it heaving up. We don't want to crack sheet rock or break windows. We don't want it to settle differentially. Uh, so we'd want to insulate this slab and we want your feet to be warm as you're standing on it, right? But it's hard to do when the substrate is doing this because we typically use a board insulation product to insulate below slabs. Well, that's difficult to do here. Um, so there's something that's sort of running against this slab on grade as a foundation assembly. The other thing is we have things like plumbing, right? We have, you know, drains for our tubs and toilets. We have plumbing supply lines for our kitchen. We have electrical lines, I mean, conduit, things like that, right? It's fine, we can run those in the slab, but it fixes it more permanently. So if we wanted to make changes in the future, or if we had trouble with any of these items, very difficult to access those things. Add in the idea that getting concrete out to the island is not an easy process. We have to work around tides. It's a scheduling issue. Concrete comes from far away. If we have any delays, it introduces just a level of complexity that we're probably not interested in. And for the bulk of the building, that's quite a bit of concrete. So I think very early on, we rejected the idea of a slab, at least for the main living space. So what are our other options? Second option to consider, and this is, pretty common construction out here on the island is a framed floor that's supported on posts and those posts are then connected back to the ledge and oftentimes we'll pour kind of a little leveling footing so that the post has a regular and predictable uh, spot to connect to that ledge elevation. And this is fine if you're okay with seeing that or we can bury these posts and you're okay with seeing that detail which you know, I wasn't really crazy about. The other problem with this is we talked about the ledge elevations are all over the place, right? So in one location, our post may be, you know, a foot tall and another it may be four feet tall. And so that has an aesthetic implication on the entire structure. Uh, but then as we start looking at the actual excavated site, right? Let's just say our, our ledge profile looks like this. Uh, and we have our 
finished floor up here and we want to maintain this really close relationship between the finished floor, the deck and the existing grade here, right? Once you get into these situations, it becomes harder to do that, right? Because we actually need some room for water to flow under this building. We can't just backfill up against this edge. We actually need to create this weather tight, fully sealed assembly at the floor. We need to insulate this floor, right? We need to add things like plumbing runs in this floor and those plumbing runs need a way to get out of the building. So what are we gonna do? Build a chase down to the, to the ground here so that that can happen. We need to protect this from all the winds coming off the water. So that means we need to add a finish on the underside of this. So think about how you might actually install this finish. Let's say it's a pressure treated plywood, a marine plywood under here. You actually need to climb under here with some tools and be able to fasten this. And in some locations, we only have a few inches to do that. So this starts to become a really impractical system when you look at just the actual topography that we're working with, the aesthetic concerns, all of those other things. So what did we actually end up with? That's the other foundation system that we see most commonly here in New England, and that is a set of footers that are cast to the ledge topography below, and then we're casting a perimeter foundation wall on top of that. Now, the great thing about that post and pier system was it minimized the amount of concrete. Like we don't have to pour all these concrete walls and these footings, but it introduced a new set of problems. And those problems were actually greater than actually pouring the concrete on these walls. So less concrete than the slab, more concrete than the posts, but it solves a number of other issues. So first and foremost, if we look at this relationship between grade, uh, existing grade out here and our finished floor, our ideal finished floor, we have our deck sitting in here. This foundation wall, pouring this foundation wall up high allows us to backfill against this foundation wall and keep this grade relationship really tight and really close. So that's, that's a real ideal thing. And now we can come back in here and waterproof this wall down here and add some drain tile at the very base here and direct any subsurface water that lands here out around and away from the building. That keeps uh, this interior crawl space in here, this semi-conditioned crawl space dry. It also means we need to insulate at this level. We're gonna insulate this vertical face here. This is gonna be a cold wall in January, right? So we don't want condensation happening on the inside face of this. So we're gonna insulate this envelope here like this. And then as we frame our floor, and you can see this is where our floor system sits. And on one side, it's connected to the side of this foundation wall with a ledger. And on the low side, as our topography is falling off like this, we've dropped the foundation wall so we can use less concrete. And then we're just platform framing this side. So the, found, the framing members bear on top of the foundation wall in this particular case here. Now this allows us access from below so we can come back and insulate. And we can actually insulate at the same time that we're doing the wall insulation and the roof insulation. We can come and run our plumbing lines here and our plumbing lines have a place to go and transition out of the building. We can have plumbing supply lines into our kitchen. We can run electricity down here. And this keeps our wind washing from happening so we don't have to install a finish on the underside of this. So this foundation system solves many of the problems that we're contending with here. And although it uses a little more concrete, uh, it's a good trade-off to make. It's a two by 12 and the top of the subfloor is right here. Right, right. So it's about 10 inches below that right there. Yes. So we need to make an adjustment here. Yeah. As we excavated the site, removed the overburden, we discovered a few areas of ledge that were a little bit higher than we anticipated. So we needed to make some changes to accommodate those areas, raising the finished floor by six inches and shifting it actually 12 inches toward the water. Uh, now we need to clean the soil off it so it's room clean and then uh, there's going to be hand work to scribe the footing forms to the ledge, drilling and pinning, uh, pouring footings, and then cast the wall. 
So we're going to focus on the foundation plan here for just a moment. As we think about the task of architectural drawings, it's really to order and organize information. And part of this job is really understanding and knowing the sequence and the order of operations out on a construction site. So who arrives first and what information do they need? As I think about the first people on site, site work contractor, the concrete sub, you know, we have to give them enough information so that they can actually locate this building on raw land in three-dimensional Cartesian space, right? So as we're looking at this drawing, we obviously have a column grid, and this column grid establishes the proportion and size and orientation of each one of these structures in relation to one another. So we have X dimensions, we have some Y dimensions in here. That's all sensible. We have that on a floor plan too. But really the Z dimension with a foundation plan becomes critically important. And you'll notice in some of the shots that you've seen so far, there's always a transit on site. And transit is just a way for us to tie back to the benchmark. We have a benchmark set over here. Our surveyor sets that at the very beginning of the project. And we use that as a reference point to establish our horizontal datums. And a datum is simply a elevation reference line. So we have a datum set for the barn slab elevation. We have one set for the main house and the screen porch and the decks. And those are all called out here in the general plan notes. And what that does is it allows us to start locating this building in three-dimensional space. And that's important because, especially as we're establishing something like a footing, right? A footing is very abstract uh, in relation to the finished floor plan, right? We're always thinking about interior space and what the finishes in the bath might be or what the paint colors are, or how the space might feel. But really establishing all those things starts with a good foundation plan. And that's because, you know, this has an aesthetic impact whether we like it or not. The footing on this site really is more about creating a flat place to set our wall forms on top of. We're not worried about bearing capacity here as we talked about. It's just a flat place. but. The top of that footing, you know, as you look at some of the formwork, it's gonna be messy, it's imperfect. The footings are often meant to be just backfilled. And that's the intent here. So if we don't orient this building correctly in vertical space, it's possible to pour the footing at an elevation where it's too high to actually backfill against. So these vertical datums in a foundation plan become really important. In order to design the foundation plan, we actually need to start at the roof. So we've drawn the roof plan, we know what that looks like. We've drawn the second floor plan, we know what that looks like. And we know, start to have a good understanding of where all of the loads are coming down, whether they're point loads or they're bearing walls. And so you'll see all of this knowledge reflected in the foundation plan. So you can see that foundation plan consists of a lot of different kinds of information, right? We have structural information. We're taking all of those loads from the roof and carrying them all the way down to the bearing substrate down below. Equally, you can see in the, in the drawing here, I've ghosted in the sort of bathroom areas. So the person who's working on the foundation you say to yourself, well, why do they care where the bathroom is? Well, that's important because we need to know where the building sewer is because the building sewer actually needs a sleeve in the wall to exit from the foundation out to the exterior septic tank. There's also other places you can see here where bonding out in this location for power going out to the barn or coming in from the street. There's security lines and phone lines and water lines. There's wall hydrants. Ideally, in the end, if you've done this correctly, you've designed this in a way so that all those systems are invisible uh, or only as expressed as you desire them to be for your architecture. So the goal of doing all this planning up front is so that you're not left with surprises out in the field. So this is obviously a lot of information to include on one drawing, and it's possible that you could forget something or leave something out. And so I've set up a series of checklists. I do this in Notion, and the foundation plan has a checklist, and I can just walk through this checklist and just make sure you haven't left anything off. So you can see here is our finished floor elevation. We have 11 and a quarter inches of framing. Our foundation wall is actually gonna come up to two and a quarter inches below this. And that basically allows us to backfill against this and keep our water out. We can do our, all of our water management to either side of that. Our floor framing then sits inboard of that in this zone. And this is how you're able to keep the finished floor close to the existing grade. You can see all the places where they're marking to drill and pin this footer to the existing bedrock. So they're doing that at 24 inches on center. They'll do that for the entire perimeter of the foundation wall. There are places where the footer actually goes away. So you can see the footer is dying. The, the formwork is dying into the side of these ledge outcroppings here. And this is the spot where the footer will die here 
and the wall will be cast on that and the wall finished wall elevation will be up in this sort of area here so the deck goes six inches down from that and then we're going to fill this with crushed stone and our deck will run all the way along in here here we have foundation wall which is going to be scribed to the ledge that's going to sit in this section here the deck is going to be in here and then this we're going to sort of reshape the granite on this edge so this will be more naturalized on this edge luther's working on framing all of the interior footings for the mechanical space so setting those elevations your office has the best view man it does every day until <laughs> the winter time yeah. not so not so warm huh no foundation this complicated Luther? No, this is the most worst one. <laughs> it's the worst. <laughs> one of the locals said it's the worst place to build.